I'm uh, a private consultant. I travel around the world, so wherever my clients are, but mainly in Europe and North America. And I'm teaching Perl, Vim, presentation skills, whatever people want, basically. Okay. Um, then most of the year I'm based in Australia, as you can tell from the accent. Okay. Uh, and I work from home. I telecommute, I work a lot on the Perl 6 project. Uh, so, and I'm you know, writing and stuff like that, so it's a good it's a good way to work. Are you also a university lecturer? I do hold an honorary associate professorship at okay. Monash University in Australia. Um, I actually put in my 10 years uh, as a, a university lecturer, but then I got let off for, for good behavior. And uh, so, but I've, I've kept my contacts there and I come back and I give guest lectures and uh, do some lecture training, lecturer training there as well. Um, your academic background, what, what, what did you study and what degrees did you obtain? So I, I have a couple of degrees, a uh, bachelor's in science and then a PhD in computer science. Uh, the PhD I was doing uh, computer graphics stuff uh, back in the days before we had the hardware to do it really easily. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as happens with your PhD, I've never done anything in graphics again. It <laughs> kind of kills you for whatever your topic was. And since then, my main problem has been, and why I didn't really pursue an academic career, um, I was doing research in like uh, eight different directions at once and that doesn't really build a, a body of work so you name it I've done it um, uh, user interface design computer programming language design uh, synthetic molecular biology uh, so you name it what do you know about fast three-dimensional rendering using isoluminance? Oh my God, no, no, it comes back to haunt me. That was my PhD topic. Okay. Uh, it was uh, a technique for uh, drawing you know, relatively simple shapes, but back before we had the hardware to do that with any kind of speed. And the whole idea was, nowadays when people draw stuff, they draw the surface and they subdivide the surface into very small polygons and render those very accurately. But back in the day when it was expensive to draw a single polygon, I came up with a different technique which I said, well, if you can mathematically compute the contours of brightness on the surface, then all you've got to do is draw each of those contours in a constant color in a single line. And of course, line drawing was much cheaper than area drawing at the time. So you just draw all these lines and it turns into a smooth surface. Okay. Wow. It was pretty cool and it would have been useful except that Moore's Law caught up with me and process of power became so powerful that it was not necessary to do these kind of optimizations anymore. I see. Oh, interesting. Um, you also mentioned you did some visualization work with biology. That's right. What sort of work did you do? Uh, I was um, supervising a PhD mainly and that was uh, on the uh, looking at the mechanisms that underlie the self-assembly of certain kinds of uh, very small structures. So. Um, in, your, in each of the cells in your body, you have these very small sort of connecting tubes um, through which nutrients and chemical messages pass. And we were looking at, well, how in the heck does that get built correctly? You know, what, what makes it build into a tube rather than some squiggly thing that you can't pass stuff through? And so we were looking at um, simulating the physics of this. And the problem at the time was that the um, the technology that we had to image these tiny structures really wasn't good enough to actually see them very well because they're very, very delicate. So are these uh, protein channels and, and lipid uh, No, these are or? they are called plasmodesmata. So they're, they're more communication channels. Okay. They're, they're uh, literally little tubes. Huh. So we couldn't really work out the exact structure of them because the technology at the time couldn't resolve them well enough to do that. So we went another approach. We said, well, th there are like three leading theories about what the shape is and we said well if we simulated each of those three theories the the behavior of the constituent proteins in those three theories and then we simulated the process of electron mic microscopy which was what was being used at the time then we'll get synthetic micrographs of these and if any of them actually looks like the real micrographs that's evidence in favor of that particular theory because if you've got a theory and you've got an accurate simulation that produces something that looks nothing like the picture, then there's possibly a problem in the theory. Okay. And that was the basis of the PhD. So it was, it was really interesting stuff and it was 
you know, I know very little about biology, but it was very nice to be able to bring the stuff that I knew about uh, visualization and simulation and computing to wow. that process. That's really fascinating. Um, to, to lead that topic for and talk about something slightly different, since you are a lecturer, or you, you were, um, there have been some people that suggested that using Java as a language for teaching CS students is sort of watering down the quality of the CS students. Like maybe Java is not the ideal language to do this, or a lot of people feel like you should be using something like C++ or Perl or C that's closer to the machine in C's case. Do you have any opinions on, on I that, don't buy ideas? the argument that because Java is relatively abstracted from the metal yeah. that it isn't a good choice for a, programming, a first programming language. Um, a lot of people came out with very, very good computing skills whose first language was Lisp, and that's as abstracted from the metal yeah, as you can right. possibly be. When I was going through, back in the Jurassic age, we were actually taught both ends of the spectrum as well. We were, we were taught Pascal as our first programming language, which again is a very abstracted kind of language, but at the same time we were also taught microprogramming. We were actually taught assembler and below that microprogramming and we were down doing the hardware as well. Back in those days computer science really was the science of building computers from the electrons up. Yeah. And I think the problem with teaching Java as the first and often the only programming language is the only bit of it. That it's, what it's teaching <coughs> is that there is one tool, one hammer in your toolkit and you have to treat everything as a nail. And what I see in a lot of curricula nowadays is a lack of diversity, a lack of experiencing different ways of thinking about computation, different ways of solving problems, different architectures, different language paradigms, different models of thinking. And that to me is the big problem. I don't mind that you teach Java first. I, th I wonder sometimes whether Java isn't too complicated to teach first since you really have to have all of the ideas simultaneously. When you're first learning to program, there are so many different levels that you need to think about simultaneously. You need to think about the algorithmic level, you need to think about the syntax level, you need to think about the semantics of what's going on in the code that you're writing, you need to think about the data structures and the layout of the code, you need to try and remember all of the bits of things that you were only taught last week and put them into practice. And I think adding on extra layers of abstraction in the sense of um, the uh, need to use libraries to do basically anything in Java, even just the object orientation, which really relies on a lot of fairly deep understanding yeah. of what computation is, yeah. is a bit much if it's your first go. Now, maybe nowadays no one comes into a, a CS degree and they haven't done programming before. Yeah. And maybe therefore you're just fitting them out for industry by teaching them the 500 pound gorilla. But you can't assume that. I but no, you can't assume that, and my experience even just uh, a decade ago was that 50% of our kids were coming in and they had no programming experience at all. They were taking the course because it looked like it was going to be a good career path. Or they were interested but they'd never had the opportunity. Right. So my concern is not what language you teach first, but what kind of diversity, what kind of ecosystem are you teaching that into? Um, I always bring up the example of bananas, or bananas as they are known here. Um, the problem with commercial bananas is that they're not grown from seed. I mean, it, bananas are famous for not having seeds in them. And the problem there is that they're all effectively clones and they're sterile and you get new banana plants by cloning existing banana plants, which means that modulo their genetic diversity that just happens from mutation, they're all the same plant, they're all the same genome. So when something like black Sikatoka fungus comes along, if it affects one banana, it affects all of them. And if you want to take this metaphor up, that's the problem with Microsoft and the Windows operating system dominating the entire market. And that's why we have so many problems with viruses, because if a virus will hit one machine, it'll hit probably all of them. But the same thing is true when you're teaching. If you're going to teach them just one set of skills, then 
they have to apply those skills to problems where that set of skills is not the set of skills to solve the problem. And you end up with lousy software because the, lou the software has to be bent and mangled and beaten into a shape so make it do what you want. that implements in Java. Yeah. So my problem is I want you to teach me 10 programming languages in the three years of my degree so that when I get out I understand functional programming, I understand declarative programming, I understand constraint programming, procedural, object oriented, aspect oriented, you name the paradigm, I've had some exposure to it. Wow, uh, excellent. So my next question probably makes no sense at all now, given what you just said, but I was going to ask if you could recommend a, a great introduction to programming book that you, just one book that you think could teach a beginning computer scientist, you know, someone starting out in school. You know, most of what they would need to know, what would that be? But I guess there isn't such a book. No, that, that's, yeah. uh, that's my message, that, yeah. you know, if there was one such book, then by the nature of it being one such book, it's not the right answer. Okay. You know, it, it's like saying, you know, yeah. can you recommend one political party? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, the whole point of having political parties is to have different ones exactly. so we get a, a diversity and a, rich, a, a richness. Okay, great. Um, so, can we move on to Pearl and talk a little bit about Pearl? I was going to, uh, first of all, I'm curious, when can we expect to see Pearl 6? Oh man, this question. <laughs> the answer I always give when people ask this question is, by Christmas. Okay, fantastic. So but I'm very careful it. not to say which Christmas. It's July now, so... Five yeah, months, but right? by a Christmas. Okay. The problem with giving you a sensible answer to that is that, like many open source projects, Perl 6 development is totally, well, almost totally volunteer driven. We do have sponsors and people who have been very generous in donating to the development process. But there, you know, we don't have a foundation of 50 programmers sitting in a room implementing Larry's ideas. What we have is a small number of people, a few of whom are supported to do the work, maybe one day a week, um, but most of whom are doing it out of the love of the language and in their own time. And that includes Larry. Yeah, yeah. You know, so the problem we have is that when you have uh, an almost entirely volunteer organization, you have carrots, but you don't have sticks. Yeah. So you can't really drive a process in that way. I mean, I think they've been doing incredibly well driving the process on timelines and getting releases out of alpha components. But if you ask me, well, how long is it going to take? Well, I can't tell you that because you know, I don't know who's going to drop out or have things that they have to do or have to, God, help us go and get a real job and earn some money. So I can't say. Um, to guess, I think next year. Okay, well, this is 2008, so sometime in 2008. Okay. Well, see, I didn't want to put the year on it so that when people are uh, yeah. watching this in 2015, they say, oh, next year it'll be out. <laughs> um, I hope people are still watching this in 2015. Um, so you've been termed as Larry Wall's interlocutor. What does that mean exactly? Um, what role do you play in the whole Pearl So my, my role, uh, I've kind of had a couple of roles in the Pearl 6 development. One has been kind of like Larry's evil nemesis. So Larry comes up with great ideas but when you come up with great ideas you need someone to come and say well maybe this would be a great idea instead or maybe this would be a different way of doing that. The, the richness of the language is that when you throw 10 or 15 solutions to a particular design problem into the pot and you argue them back and forth and you need another set of eyes that's coming from a very different perspective, a different point of view, so that those eyes can see the things that you miss. Especially if you're developing the ideas, you can sometimes not see some of the ramifications of it. So I, I conceive that as being one of my ideas, but also in, in the reverse sense of throwing ideas in the pot as well that Larry can then adapt and modify to his needs so that um, we get the best of both worlds. In addition, um, I guess one of my skills is in communicating. And so I've seen my role as being a way of um, bringing all of the stuff that's going on in the development process and boiling it down into a form that people can relate to, that can see why it's important, 
can understand why it's taking so long and why it's so hard to get it right. So, uh, you know, being in some sense the the public face of it, the um, the guy that that explains it to the world uh, in ways. Because uh, I mean, the design documents are terrific, but they're very highly technical and they're very um, focused and truncated on just getting the details out. And for most people, that's not enough to pick up the subtleties and the nuances of the design and see, oh yeah, well I could really use that. So part of my job has been to find ways of bringing the relevance of what we're doing back to the community and, and keep them informed of it. Okay, excellent. Um, could you explain the differences between Rakudo and Pugs? Did I say that correct? Rakudo? Rakudo, yeah. yeah. Well, I, we probably didn't say it correctly because we didn't say it with a Japanese accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that I, I won't try and butcher it by doing that. Rakudo, uh, in Pearl 5 has, has been... Um, uh, almost famous for the fact that it's only ever had one implementation. Uh, and that's been a, a weakness in some regards uh, along the lines of the genetic lack of diversity that I was talking about earlier. But it's also been a tremendous strength because if it works in one place, it'll almost certainly work anywhere else. Pearl 6, we're changing that model quite a bit. We're saying we want to have multiple implementations out there if we possibly can. Uh, and anything that passes the spec, which is effectively a, an enormous test suite, can call itself Pearl 6. So the very first implementation that was being created was um, organized and largely driven by Audrey Tang, who's an incredibly talented Pearl programmer. Uh, she's based in Taiwan and was actually implemented in Haskell, the functional programming language Haskell and uh, was an extremely sophisticated and complete implementation of a prototype of Perl 6. That project has uh, kind of stalled a little bit as Audrey has moved on to other projects and interests and the long-term goal was always to create an implementation that ran on the Parrot virtual machine. And initially that one was just called Perl 6, but when we started to realize that we wanted a whole ecosystem of implementations, you can't just make one of them called Perl 6 because that's not fair. So we needed to come up with another name. And a name that I had come up with several years ago was Rakudo. And in, um, it was kind of an abbreviation of Rakuda Do, which in Japanese means way of the camel which kind of seemed to fit. Sure, yeah. Um, but Pearl. the abbreviation to Rakudo, the word Rakudo itself means paradise. So we thought, well, you know, that's a pretty high target for it, but that's what we'd like to achieve. So that's what it's called. It's basically simply the implementation of Perl 6 that runs on top of the Parrot virtual machine. So the differences in terms of practicalities of them is that Rakudo is currently undergoing very, very rapid development and advancement and change and Pugs is pretty much static now. It's not really being changed at all. Um, they're about comparable in the percentage of Perl 6 they implement, but they have other differences too. Because um, Rakudo runs on top of Parrot, once it's compiled, it runs very quickly because the Parrot, the Parrot is a very effective virtual machine, but we still haven't optimized the, um, the front layer of it so that it compiles quickly. On the other hand, Pugs compiles extremely quickly, but because it runs interpreted on Haskell, which runs interpreted itself, it runs comparatively slowly. Oh, interesting. Uh, are there plans to incorporate other languages onto the uh, Parrot JVM? That is one of the defining characteristics. One of the major specifications that we had for Parrot was that it had to be easily targetable by pretty much any dynamic language. It's really a virtual machine that's aimed at dynamic languages. The big virtual machines out there, the JVM, yeah. the .NET framework, CLR, yeah. are mainly targeted at languages that are predominantly statically typed. Yeah. And you can certainly implement dynamically typed languages on them as JPython has, Jython has demonstrated very effectively, yeah. but they're not really optimized for it. So the Python runtime is optimized and there are, I, I couldn't list them all for you, but there are like a dozen languages that we currently have prototype implementations for. Uh, 
And of course the other thing is by having a common runtime layer underneath, and it's a very high level abstract runtime, we're hoping that we're going to get a lot better interact, uh, interoperability between those languages so that you can um, take, for example, a Java library that you would like to use in Perl 6 and just use it. And the objects that are coming out of the Java library can be treated as being Perl 6 objects within the limitations of their semantics. That's, so that's fascinating. It's a, it's a very exciting it's like thing. dogs sleeping with cats. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's that, that kind of uh, sign of the apocalypse coming. <laughs> um, could you talk a little bit about the dynamic type system in Perl 5? So, the idea of a dynamic type system is that variables are just containers. They're generic containers. So, you go down to the container box store and you buy a box you don't go down there and buy a box that can only be used to store jumpers or a box that can only be used to store records or something like that. You go down and buy a box. And of course what you put in the box determines what kind of box it is. It's the, the sweater box or it's the record box or it's the junk box or it's the scraps box. And dynamic languages work that way. It's the values in dynamic languages that have types, just as they do in static languages. But when you put a value with a type into a variable, that variable then assumes, to, in some way, the type constraints of that value. And the only things you can do now with that variable are the things that you could do with that kind of value. But if you take that out of the box and put a different kind of value in, then the box changes and has a different behavior. That turns out to be very powerful because it's a kind of late binding. So you don't have to make your decisions statically at compile time and end up sometimes with bad decisions. And in many respects, um, when we're talking, for example, about OO, um, object orientation seems to work better if you do have that ability to be late bound, to leave decisions, defer decisions, until you actually have the object and you call a method on it and it does whatever. Now, in object-oriented languages which are predominantly statically typed, and I'm thinking here, for example, of C++ and to a lesser extent Java, you can very occasionally get bugs that come in because the static type of the variable that you put a dynamic value in is compatible but not identical. And that can lead to occasionally very strange behaviours going on. Dynamic languages, everything in it is dynamically determined. When you do something, that's when you look at the type and that's when you decide whether you're allowed to do it or not. Now that has the advantage of it's less susceptible to mismatches at the compile stage. It has the disadvantage that you get, tend to get your error messages at runtime rather than at compile time, which puts a lot more emphasis on good testing. Um, so they're introducing static typing in Pro 6. We are. And why are they doing this? Was there a sort of a, a backlash or what, it, what was the motivation for doing this? The, the motivation for it is... Um, and will you keep dynamic typing as well? Oh yeah. The first thing to say is Perl 6 is a dynamically typed language. There is no question about that. The type information resides with the values. Perl 5, if you look at it the right way, you've kind of got to squint your eyes and tilt your head a little bit, but if you look at it the right way, it's also a statically typed language. So in Perl 5, you have basically three kinds of variables. You have a scalar variable, you have an array, and you have a, a hash, which is an associative array or a dictionary in other languages. And the only thing you can put into scalar variables are scalars. Now, the point is that there are strings and numbers and references and all kinds of scalars, but you can only put a scalar in there. Yeah. Uh, and there are operations, for example, that you can only do on an array. And if you try and do one of those operations and give I it a see. scalar, it will give you a compile time error. So Perl 5 already has this static typing, but it's, it's a very um, indiscriminate kind of static typing. There are only three choices. So what we decided is, well, the static typing has advantages too, in the sense that if you know what kind of values you want to put in a variable, then it can be very nice to get compile time warnings when you don't. So it would be very nice to have the option of adding static typing. But of course, optional static typing is almost a, a, an oxymoron. It, it only works if it's always there. So what we think of Perl 6's type system is, is it is a statically typed system with defaults. 
So you don't have to put a type on a variable, but if you don't, then it defaults to its universal type, which again is scalar or array or hash. I see. But you can say, no, I want to be more specific about that, not just a scalar, but a scalar that can only store numbers. So if you need it, it's there. If you don't, it's not going to get in your way. Excellent. That's, that's great. So parameter passing modes in Perl 6, there's a positional, named, and something called Slurpee. Most importantly, what is Slurpee? Okay. Can you talk briefly about the other let, let me Let me go back to this. The, the most important thing to say is Perl 6 subroutines have parameters. Perl 5 ones don't. They just everything just comes in in one big array and you have to extract it yourself. Yep. You know, this is only 40 years since the concept was first used in programming languages. So we're getting there eventually. <laughs> we're all familiar with positional parameters. Positional parameters just say, look, the first argument has to be the name, the second has to be the rank and the third has to be the serial number. Yeah. And that works great for name, rank and serial number because that's the order you always put them in anyway. Yeah. But what you find with and most languages really only provide positional parameter lists or arguments. Yeah. The problem with that, it works great when you've got one or two or maybe three parameters, but some subroutines need like eight or 10 or 15 to do their job because they're just so configurable. Yeah. And the problem is when you've got eight, how do you remember the order of them? And, and the answer is you don't. You have to go and look them up every time you want to use them. Yep. So an alternative way of passing parameters is by saying, I'm going to pass you the eight arguments here, but I'm going to give each of them a name. I'm going to label each of them. And if they've got a label, it doesn't matter what order they come in, because I can look at the label and say, oh, so that's the name and that's the rank and that's the serial number. So that sort of named parameter passing isn't really well supported in most languages. It's certainly not at the compiler level. And most people will pass a dictionary or a hash or an associative array which has names and keys, but then there's no um, type checking or sanity checking on that. You have to inst in install it yourself. So Perl 6 has that built in. Um, every parameter obviously has a name, but what you can do when you call the subroutine, you can just say the name of the parameter and then the value, and it will get assigned to that even if it's in the wrong order. Yeah. And there's a slightly different syntax that says this is a named one, so it knows to rearrange them. Now the problem with that is that there's one other thing that you want to do when you're passing parameters. A lot of subroutines will have a fixed number of usually one or two parameters that tell them what to do. And then you often have a, an arbitrary number of parameters that follow that say this is the data to do it on. So a simple example of that is a map or apply operation where you say, here's a little function that I want you to apply to each of the following values. And it's going to be a list of values, and there could be one of them or there could be 100,000 of them. So of course, I don't want to have to define 100,000 name parameters to do that. I want to have something that just, having taken the expected first parameter, just sucks up all the remaining parameters into a single array structure. And that's a slurpy parameter. It wow. slurps up all the remaining arguments and presents them to you in one container, which you can then process in a sensible sort of way. Interesting. So that's an extremely functional feature of Perl, I would say, right? Yes, yeah. And Perl 6, we are bringing far better support for functional styles of programming into the language. So currently it has support for map and apply. Are there any new? Uh, well, the most important new one is reduce. Reduce, oh. Uh, and, and without that, you really can't get to the end of your functional programming on list operations yeah. because you can never boil it down to the, the yeah. one value you want. But most of the extra features that were required were not so much um, built-in functions, but the ability to have this sophisticated parameter specification mechanisms and also to have um, multiple subroutines with the same name but different parameter lists so you don't have to cater for every parameter possibility and then do if statements. Functional languages, most of them will allow you to say there will be three different versions of the head function the first of which, if you give it an empty list, will give you back an empty list. If you give me back a single value, I'll give you back that value. If you give me back a list, I'll give you the first one and then do the head on the rest. So we're going to support that as well in Perl 6.
uh, the sigils. Can you just talk a little about what they are, if I pronounce that correctly, and uh, is that being removed for Pearl Six? Right. Okay, so I can never tell when someone from North America is pr pronouncing something correctly because <laughs> you get everything wrong as far as I can tell. The, wor the word I use is sigils. Sigils, okay. And the sigils are the line noise at the start of variables in Perl. Now, this is not an idea that Perl invented. If you use any kind of shell, that you, you know that the environment variables has dollar signs at the start of them. Well, in Perl, any scalar variable has the dollar sign at the start of it. If it's an array, it has an at sign. If it's a dictionary or a hash, it has a percentage sign. And those then give us the ability to have both a scalar variable and an array that have the same identifier name, but have different purposes. So Perl has had these from its very beginning, and there's always been a problem with them. The problem with them has been that they are like grammatical inflections, so that if I have a, an array, I put an at sign in front of it, which is roughly the same as saying these things. But when you want to talk about one of those, you have to say this thing. You can't say these thing. Yeah. So in Perl 5, what you do to make that work is if you want to refer to one element of an array, you change the sigil. You change it from the at sign, which means these, to the dollar sign, which means this. And then you put a, a, a lookup in it, a square brackets to say which index you want. Yeah. And linguistically, that's a very elegant idea. And it gives you the ability to specify quite subtle distinctions of behavior. But it turns out that in practice, 90% of the programming population just can't get that idea into their heads. And it's not because they're dumb, it's just because it's not a natural way for them to think. The natural way to think about sigils is, if it's a dollar, then it's a scalar. If it's an array, then it's an at sign. If it's a percentage sign, then it must be a hash. And the problem is that if, when you have to change the sigil, when you change the way you use it, that confuses people, especially people who speak English, because we don't do that very much. Other languages have a lot more inflection when you change how you're using a word. Not so for English. So we found that a lot of users of this just were not capable of dealing with the, oh, you have to change the sigil even though it's the same variable. So in Perl 6, we changed that. In Perl 6, the line noise out the front of a variable always stays the same. If it's an array, it stays at sign no matter what you're doing with it, whether you're looking it up, whether you're taking a sub list of it or whatever. That's been a really important change in Perl 6. It's going to be challenging for experienced Perl 5 programmers, but once you get the hang of it, you never want to go back. It's very much better. I asked you earlier what books do you think would be great for an aspiring computer science student, uh, but more general from that, what, what general advice would you give to a young aspiring programmer? And I think you sort of touched on that earlier. I, but I think that my advice, that. if I'm going to be consistent, would echo what I've said, and that is it's good to be deep as a programmer, it's good to be deeply talented in one or two fields, but it's more important to be broad. It's more important to have at least a general understanding of a great range of ways of doing things, a great many styles of programming, a great number of programming languages, and to just be familiar with a lot of different algorithmic approaches to things. Because that gives you repertoire. It gives you the ability to, in a particular situation when it's crunch time and there's not time to come up with a clever technique just out of your head, you've got something to fall back on. You say, oh, well, if we were using Haskell for this, then we would just do this thing. Yeah. Can we adapt that to what we're doing? Now, I'm not saying you have to use Haskell to solve it. Could we use that kind of approach? And I think that's really important. To be a good programmer, you have to be a broad programmer. And the other thing that I would say is that to be a good programmer, you have to actually program. And this is something that, that doesn't happen. You know, we go through our schooling, we start out, we learn all these things and we're constantly doing exercises and assessments and so forth. And then you get out and you start going to meetings and you start doing design and all the rest of it and you stop coding. And if you get promoted, then you're literally promoted out of the opportunity to do any coding. And I think that's a problem. If you want to be a really good tennis player, you will go out and practice every day. If you want to go and be a great martial artist, you'll be in the dojo every single day. If you want to be a great 
programmer, you will code every day, even if you have to find time on your own to do that. You know, even if you're up at 11 and you're a programmer, you'll be up at 11 o'clock at night anyway, three o'clock in the morning <laughs> anyway. Some of that time at least has got to be spent coding because as soon as you get rusty, you start dying as a coder. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. This has been Damian Conway. Thank you very much. Thank you.